Welcome to First Things First. I'm Brooke Blurt and my pronouns are she and her. I'm Maddie Mills, my pronouns are he and him. And before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge the custodians of the land on which we record. And for me, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And for me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Let's get into Let's it. Go. Yama, 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 sis. How are you? I'm good, Kaya. Okay, we're going with language. We're okay. going to give these more, you know, yeah, pumped a little, up. A bit of sprinkle of culture. You know? <laughs> culture oh. with a K. <laughs> with a culture, culture. Yeah, a bit of culture. Oh, um, how are you? Easter weekend. Yeah. Revived, rested, hungover. All Ooh. of the thoughts. <laughs> okay, I'm interested in all the stories. What happened? I Tell know, me, how was your long weekend? Stories. Honestly, this weekend has been so good. I've rested, mm. but I did have, I did get a bit excited at the basketball. Well, I wouldn't say get excited. I was excited, <laughs> and then I got sad because we lost. Well, uh, well I'm was... excited because it seems like you might be playing for a team. You're there that often. Are you on one of the teams? <laughs> <laughs> team manager. <laughs> H2O. <laughs> Water girl. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm always there, yes. And you yeah. know what? It's so funny because I take a different guy each time. <laughs> <gasps> just a friend, just friends. But it's I love so funny because if Daily yeah. Mail were onto it, God, the articles out there would be hilarious because I like- generally do take a different person each to the basketball. Oh, I love that. Is it like the American um, basketball where you come up on the screen and there's a kiss cam and there's like a celebrity spotting? Do they ever get you on there? Yeah, I'm there every time. Oh, so it's a lot. It. Take but, me next time. Well, yes. <laughs> Melbourne United. I mean, I was a Perth Wildcat supporter, so clearly traded them in. <laughs> oh, can you do that? See, I'm really loyal. I've been gone for the Bulldogs since I can remember, and the only reason I go for the Bulldogs is because my dad goes for the Bulldogs. Don't even know who fucking plays on the team other than Josh Adokar. But like I'm Oh, you're so talking loyal. rugby. I was yes. like, what? No, no, no. I'm, I'm oh, talking just loyalty like, to a team. Okay. Like I yeah. I feel too loyal <laughs> to change my team, even though secretly I go for the Rabbitohs because all the black fellas play on that team True. and some of my friends. But to my dad, I'm a doggy supporter. How could yeah. you change teams? I'm I'm not I'm I think because that. I've been in Melbourne for three years now, like I'm, I don't know, it's just more home. And I think the mm. Wildcats, I don't know what's going on in there. I can't watch their games unless they play here. But then Wildcats. I'm like I know. Remind me of High School Musical. I know. Well, cats <laughs> everywhere. Wave your hands up. Yeah, it's Troy air. Bolton. Who's your Troy Bolton on the team? Tell me. Mm, Troy Bolton. Oh, Chris Goulding. Chris Goulding, 43. Ooh. He is, oh. He's 43 or his number's 43? His number's 43. I was going to say, that's, nah, a, he's that's a young a fella. old fella for that team. <laughs> no, no, but, you know, age is just a number. Age Don't be judging. Age is just judging. a number. No, I'm not. I'm not an ageist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Aboriginal. No. Um... <laughs> No, Chris Goulding is like the Troy Bolton of Melbourne United. And, yeah, I am there every fucking weekend. Tonight I'm actually going to the MVP Awards. I probably will get an award because I've been at the same game wow. every game. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Oh, my oh, God. Most reliable fan. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you know, what? There, there could possibly be an award for that. But I'm asking what keeps you going back? Is it the game? Is it the sport? Is it a man? Is it friends? Is it are you married to the CEO? Tell us the goss. Um, no, Nick is the CEO and he's amazing. If you mm-hmm. ever come across a man called Nick Chulson, he is the CEO of Melbourne United and he is an absolute angel. Him mm-hmm. and Tom always invite me. They listen to my podcast on the Imperfects and mm. yeah, he just gravitated towards me. We're really good it. friends. And yep. then, yeah, understood who I was, mm-hmm. who I am. And every week I just go because of the people. Like Eddie yeah. Betts is there most weekends with these boys. Um, Fev's there every weekend. Yeah. I honestly think it breaks it up midweek if there's a game on or something to do. I just I don't have any sport hobbies anymore. Yeah. Like football was my life, obviously, yep. but I'm just a bit over football. I'm actually over footballers, to be fair with you. Okay. They're yep. just... So far up their fucking ass these days. It's like, oh, really? I've just become friends with a couple. Oh, well, they're probably nice ones, but like, mm. it's just a different leg. Basketball, yeah. I just enjoy it. But yeah. I think, yeah, it's, the season's done now, and I'm like, shit, what am I going to do in my other spare time that I mm. don't have? <laughs> well, look, if I'm ever in Melbourne, please take me along. I've always wanted to go to a basketball game. Never been. Done. Yeah. Never been. But you mentioned the Imperfects podcast, and I feel like um, yeah. this episode we wanted to talk about healing. Ooh, yes. And you shared so much on that podcast about yourself. I remember listening, and I saw the social videos, uh, and you got really emotional. Was that like a cathartic experience for you? Was that a moment where you were able to like share authentically and and obviously there was a massive reaction to that? Yeah. So how did you take that? It kind of scared me to be fair because 
the Imperfects are quite popular in Melbourne. Like I think, mm-hmm. you know, Hugh, um, Ryan and Hugh's brother, they're all just really good men. And you would think, oh, you know, being around a table with men, you wouldn't feel that comfortable to be that vulnerable. Like I don't mm. think ideally that would be a situation that I would have felt that, yeah. but I did. And I think it's really tribute to them as people because mm-hmm. they they offer that space and that environment for you to feel safe feel comfortable but also like they wouldn't push you or anything like that that it yeah. you know they've got you kind of thing and I think I love that it was cathartic you're right it was really cathartic but I think I heard already spoken about many of those things that I did on that podcast through mm. my memoir big love and through my speaking events when I do yeah. keynote speaking and I do you know talk about all this stuff so mm-hmm. it wasn't anything different than I'm not yeah. talking about but I think it was the gravity of how many people actually listen to their podcasts, which is so crazy because I think, you know, their podcasts that we'd probably admire to be hitting, you know, their numbers are so big. Average 300,000 listens an episode or something like that. Like it was hectic. And I honestly now get people come down the road for me, spot me, and they're like, I really loved your episode on The Imperfects. And I'm like, just strangers. Mm-hmm. Everywhere. It's happened yeah. to me in the airport. It's happened to me at Coles. It's happened to me random. Like, it could be anywhere. And I think that is a real big tribute to those boys because, well, those men, they're not boys. They're actually great men mm-hmm. um, because they offer that space and that opportunity. And they were actually at the basketball last weekend, so I was like. Oh, like, a little full circle moment. Yeah. But, and I mean. R- Ryan's in a Hollywood film at the moment, ooh. actually, with John Cena, Troy Bolton, talking about Troy Bolton. Oh. Um, Zac Efron is in it. The reason I ask you is because we obviously going to touch on healing this episode, but I've been yep. speaking recently about um, sharing through therapy. And yes. I know that we both do this. You say that you you can you've shared your story on different platforms, different formats, and sometimes do you ever find that when you're sharing it, you're detaching yourself from it and it's like it's someone else's story, um, so that you don't I suppose get hurt again or you don't be triggered by some of the incidents that you're talking about or the experiences or the environments that we've lived in. For me, I always have this thing where I disassociate from my life story when I'm telling my story. Yeah. And it's a protective thing, but it also is something that I feel like we need to be aware of or I need to be aware of because I'm telling it as if it hasn't happened to me, you know? There's yeah. there's there's so much disconnection to the emotion of it because I want to protect myself and I want to protect like how much that past and those traumatic experiences affect me. Yeah. And I've been speaking to my therapist about it and one of the things he was like is you have to face these things to heal from them. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. actually have to walk into the, we call it a storage unit. Every time I go into therapy weekly, we call it a storage <laughs> unit. We walk in there and we pick a box to unpack and it's like we don't know what box oh. we're going to unpack. But yep, we're going to open it. Done that, yeah. Yeah, and we're yep. going to see what's in there and we're just going to go through, you know, piece by piece and try and figure out like what that means to me, how I can feel, like actually feel those things that have happened instead yep. of just disassociating it and putting it to the back of my mind because because one day that storage unit's going to get full. Yeah. It's going to be bursting at the seams and I'm going to have to go in there and it's going to be a much tougher job. So, like, for you, in terms of healing, talking about it, is that a way you're able to heal from your experiences, do you feel? Or is it? are you still disassociating? Because I know that you were quite emotional on the podcast. Kind of both, if I'm being honest. So, it's so crazy how, you know, similar experiences happen in therapy and mm. therapy is actually so... Um, it just creates such a self-awareness about yourself and, like, your experiences. And I think that's probably what I really love about therapy and what I've learned moving forward and, I guess, how I live my life now. But I think I do definitely disassociate. I think when I'm talking about it, I focus on the words rather than the feelings. Mm, and yeah. some moments I do really tap into those big moments if I'm mm-hmm. definitely trying to execute a moment in a speech. Mm-hmm. Um for sure, like they need those moments to have silence and the pauses because that allows people to be like, yeah, shit, you, yeah, wow. Yeah, digest. Like, yeah. Um, but that's, again, you know, that's there's some sort of like performative aspect to keynote speaking and mm-hmm. it's talking about, like if it was talking about a, how this wall is brown, then I mm-hmm. could talk about it, but it's about my life. So I have yeah. to actually be like, yeah, like I have to tap into those experiences and... 
I think it depends on where I'm at and where I'm up to with that healing as well. Yeah. I yep. think, like you said, you know, when you go into your storage unit and you pick a box and you figure out what you're going to unpack, I think that also contributes to where I'm at because we don't do um, boxes, but in my therapy sessions, we do like folders and bi- mm-hmm. like we open a, a filing cabinet and we pick out yeah. a file. <laughs> it's oh. So it's so funny. It's so good yeah. to visualize though, right? Because- I was going to say the yeah. visualization of that and seeing it in a, a more like practical sense of healing mm. like I, I posted a video the other day and and you you loved it yeah I know the, exactly what you're talking the about glass. the glass yeah so the thing is healing is always going to happen you're going to heal from different things at different times like life is keeps happening so healing mm-hmm. keeps happening so the explanation or the visualization was a glass and it was like orange juice or coffee right mm-hmm. and it was the water fountain was pouring into the already full glass Mm -hmm. and the colour was obviously like dispersing and and getting um, more clear over time and that kind of represents like healing. Like, yeah, it's full and and it's murky and it's cloudy and everything is happening and all, you know, and that kind of represents like trauma and um, insecurities and experiences. Exactly. And then over time you slowly work at it and it's never going to happen that quickly as that glass is, you know, filling out. But over time your life gets, I guess, more, you get more perspective, you get more clear, Mm. um, you get more direction and you get more comfortable with yourself and where you're going, what you're doing. And I think, like, it's always going to be that journey. Um, mm-hmm. And I think healing is a journey, full stop. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that it, disassociation that you talk about, Maddie, like, mm. do you find, like, you've talked about your life so much? Because for me, I've talked about it so much at some points, like, I generally, it's not like I've generally grieved the process. I just have spoken about it so much that it's like a muscle that I've already learned and activated and it's there, if that Mm. makes sense. Like, like talking about my mum and my grandmother passing away, I now think I've got so many good things happening in my life that I can see that time was being really hard. But I've like, I thank that time as well because I'm like, well, it's unfortunate that that's happened, but at the same time, I wouldn't be here and I'm really grateful to be here. I yeah. don't know. I use, like, my past experiences now as, like, more ammunition to... Oh, yeah. I yeah. I absolutely see that and I, I do the same thing. Like, for me, I always think I have this notion in my head that I didn't have to go through everything for nothing. Yeah. I went through everything so I can use it as a currency and I can actually, if there's a transaction there, it's like I went through that. Yeah. Or like a lot of trauma, a lot of negative experiences as a young person to create a really strong human being who can then tackle the world at like a more resilient point. And I feel like as I get older and I look back on like my life, there's always the question, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> and it's like every next thing that happens in my world, like there are these things that are just aligning at the moment that are just oh, like, right? wow. <laughs> like, and, and, I, and I go for my walks in the morning and I just have these moments of like, how the fuck did I get here? And it was, I hurdled. I jumped each hurdle and I kept on going and that next hurdle came and I jumped it. And I feel like the experiences as a young kid really led me to be able to do that. Mm. Like it taught me resilience. It taught me that if I didn't like the way that my world was going to be, you know, handed to me or if I didn't like the cards that were drawn for me, I could change them. I could yeah. create something different. I could create a life that was, you know, breaking cycles. I could create a life that was going to empower my family for the future. Yeah. So I always have these thoughts of younger Maddie as this these building blocks. He could take on so much. And sometimes when I think, oh, it's all too much, I think, no, no, no. Because, like, how could 12-year-old Maddie go yeah. through that, yeah, yeah, get yeah. through that, conquer and do well? Yeah. And you can do the same, you know? Like the yeah. tough thing to sometimes digest for me is that we're mm. young people full of really traumatic experiences mm. and we have to, like that glass, we need to filter through them so that we're not, we don't get old and yeah. bitter and twisted and hate the world. 100%. And that's work for us. Yeah, You know, that, that's work for us. And I was explaining some of these experiences to a um, girl who I met two weeks ago mm. and she was like, okay, I can't hear anymore. She literally said to me, she was like, I, I can't hear, like it's too hard for me. And I was like, okay. 
And that was a realisation that, yeah, those experiences that I went through as a kid definitely weren't everyday experiences. No. We've gone through some tough shit, yeah. but we're here now. And, like, Crazy, yeah. I love that analogy of the glass because I feel like I really resonate with that. I'm like, mm. at the moment I'm doing all the things to clear out the muck of the water and I'm, yeah. like, heading towards a clear glass of water. And maybe it will never be clear, but one day it will be clearer than it is now and that's, like, that's all I can hope for. I did this speech once and it was uh, – and I used an ex-boyfriend's tattoo as a reference, which is kind of ra- random, oh. right? Yeah. So okay. one of my ex-boyfriends had um, a dot, dot, dot tattooed on his wrist mm. and I constantly always looked at it and he would always say, oh, it's just to be continued. To and be I'm like, continued. And I think, yeah. like, that's a really good way – and I used this in my speech, which was quite funny, because at any point in something you can always come back to it. Mm -hmm. And I think with healing is, like, something might not be working for you then and there. It's like, say, therapy or say that you are having, you know, some huge, like, issues with boundaries or something. You Mm -hmm. can always come back to it. You can always, like, be like, okay, right now I'm really struggling with this, but I'm not going to, like, push myself or, like... And I think the dot, dot, dot is always, like, to be continued. Like, life is to be continued. Experiences are to be continued. Love and health, you can always come back around. Like, yeah. And I think with some people with some experiences that they've had or they've how they've grown up or whatever, they get really stuck in that mud, like you said, mm. and they won't – people that are really pessimistic, they're like, oh, well, that's yeah. just me. And, like, I had an ex-boyfriend that was just like that and was like, yeah. oh, well, this is just me and my mum did this to me and I'm like, oh, I just – I one, I don't think that is great self-awareness. Yeah, and victim and mentality is going to exactly. allow you to stay in that victim yep. mindset. 100%. And I mm. think there has been so many times in my life where I could have been playing that victim mentality totally. if I really wanted to. But mm-hmm. it wasn't going to get me anywhere. I wanted yeah. to move forward from it and I wanted to persist and be something in my life. So that's mm. why I walked past it. Right now I think like – I look at younger Brooke as well sometimes mm-hmm. and I'm like, she was a tough bitch. Right yes. now, I'm a princess. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I'll, you know. <laughs> but you in your soft girl era. Yeah, like yeah, last year girl era. was my soft girl <laughs> era. And I'm still in that because I think, like, it's such a good reminder of times when you are trying to be tough and you're trying to, like, do everything and, like, mm. you know, achieve things and push for things and you're like, oh, fuck, I just like Control actually, everything. 100%. Oh, because like re- re- relinquishing control is... Is, oh my god, so that's, that, that's a big like <laughs> indicator that you are like growing. And yeah. I've had that recently. Like I'm like, okay, that's one thing that I'm working on. I'm like, I can't yeah. control everything. Why would I even fucking try? And yeah. to manipulate the world is to create a version of something that you want that isn't real. So like, let it go. Yeah, and I'm there. I agree. I think mm. that was one thing. And I'm still working on that. I, that mm-hmm. is one thing I'm definitely working on is that yep. I can't control the way people think of me or what they think of me. I can't yeah. tr- control people, um, how they think, how they do things. Mm-hmm. I think it definitely always and always, majority of things, do come from your childhood, right? Yes. And how you developed in that those crucial years. And if mm-hmm. people really look at it and really look at what they were taught or how they were brought up, it would make so much sense to why they are the way they, they, they are. But they Ooh, think yeah. people don't really want to reflect. It's too scary. It's not. It's, they don't looking want to in go a mirror, there. it's hard. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like, you know, you don't see the things that you, you want to see. You see imperfections. You see yeah. things that are, you know, broken and, and hard to face. But, like, that is the that is the reality of life. Like, yeah. when we look in the mirror, we have to accept who we are. We have to, the things we want to be better at or to, to you know, you want to see differently, you have to work on that. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about healing. When you feel like you're on that vibe and you're very, you know, focused into, you know, healing or growth, what are some of the indicators for you that make you feel like you're on track and some of the indicators that make you feel like you're off track? Oh, really good question, actually. Okay, one of when I'm not on track mm-hmm. is if I'm very uncomfortable about being by myself and in my own company. Okay, yep. So if I'm really struggling and I feel like I need to be amused have noise, see someone, be with someone, there's something going on with me that I'm trying to fill a void yeah. and I'm not comfortable with my own space and what's going on within me yeah. and I'm like, okay, I need to face this. Like I don't know what it is. And yep. it usually gets um, it gets triggered by relationships mainly. I think, yeah. oh, I'm 
not good enough and I go down, the, you know, that, salt, yeah. that whole route of like, I wouldn't, I'll always be alone. Have you seen the bla- <laughs> you know? Have you seen the Black Cat Labrador? Yes, I have. Okay, good, because we can discuss that in another episode, but, girl, you need to be the black cat. You look like one today. I do look like a black cat. <laughs> You're giving black cat energy. You need to, you know, turn the bitch dial up <laughs> and just go for it. I have been hearing this, like, all over my TikTok and all over my social media about it. I'm obsessed with it. her. I want to do the masterclass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah. I definitely I get more triggered, I guess, by people and relationships when – I get, like, rejected. So if I get rejected, then I obviously spiral a little bit and I have to pull yeah. myself back in. When I'm mm-hmm. doing really well is that I'm feeling an alignment. So things are happening naturally. I'm not forcing them. I'm not pushing for them. They're happening when they should. Um, mm. And that's when I know I'm on the right track because that's the energy that I'm putting out and that's what I'm getting back as well. So you know how you were saying, like, things just happen yeah. and you're like, oh, how the fuck did I get here? I yeah. think that for me is a good indicator that I'm on the right track and I'm doing yeah. the work. But yeah. consistency is one thing that I really struggled with, especially with therapy and especially with doing the work and doing mm-hmm. the homework. Yeah, I was always going to therapy and I'd be like, no, oh, yeah, I'll do the homework. I'll do the hierarchy of needs, like Googling things and like researching yeah. things. And I think when I was younger, these are the things that really helped me and I wrote them down actually. The first thing when I was younger is I felt like I lacked support. So when I Mm -hmm. went into therapy, my therapist was like, okay, what are the five people that you are surrounding yourself with? And I couldn't name five consistent people. Yeah, wow. So that was my goal was to get five consistent people that I thought that I could Mm -hmm. rely on and if I was in trouble that they would be there. And that really helped. And then the other thing was the focus on um, this wheel that's specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander social and emotional well-being. It's like a pizza chart. It is. Yeah. And I never referred to, you know, when people are like, oh, you don't look Aboriginal, and you're like, what am I, a fucking pizza, like split into eight pieces? <laughs> but when I look She's at this... love it. <laughs> when I look at this wheel and it says social and emotional well-being, which is meaning me, I mm. think, personally, it's me mm-hmm. as a whole of a person, I looked at all of the things and it, the things that impact it are... Uh, experiences and um, political and social experiences around. And then I think in the inside it's got connection to culture, connection to family, kinship, ancestors, connection to land, connection to self. And I started putting all of those pieces together, meaning I started to... Understand how much of those pieces take up certain percentages of your life? 100%. And how much... Uh, do I feel connected to all of those pieces? Okay. And yep. so, and I was only like, you know, coming out of u- like high school, going into university because I was studying um, at university. Yeah. Well, yep. I was studying um, actually sports science, which is re- really random. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then went into working with Pat Dudgeon, actually, who was working in mental health. She's like one of the leading mental health Aboriginal. Uh, physician kind of people yeah. yeah and she she sort of made up this model or like was in the design process of developing this module and I just thought it helped me so much it sounds yeah. so weird but this wheel and it, interpreting it as myself and as who I am as a whole and like yeah. what actually makes me me yeah I just started like working on those pieces together like yeah. I thought well if this one lacks that means I've got to fill that up a bit so then you know it's a full thing you know like yeah and I think those are the two things that really helped me in my youth which is mm-hmm. so unusual to come across and to you know to to use yeah but now I use it so actively in when I'm working with kids and I think it definitely helps with a healing process like it starts it off that's a thing yeah. you've got to take the first step and I think that's that's a really good tool, is what mm-hmm. I would say, in your tool, yeah. in your in your little virtual backpack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, virtual I backpack. Lo- yeah, yeah, your virtual backpack. Why not? Or yeah. like your toolkit. <laughs> yeah, your tool, your toolkit, or your virtual backpack. Like that's yeah. a tool or something that can go in there. That's like when I'm not feeling my best. Which mm. piece am I lacking right now? Yeah. yeah, I um, I know that you know for Black followers and First Nations people across the board, you know whether we're Aboriginal here or you know 
in another um, country, there is a different idea of healing. And I feel like it does have a lot to do with our spirit and our identity and how we feel inside. Yeah. And I know that um, the Healing Foundation, which was um, which began in 1997 um, after the report um, of the National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from Their Families, was tabled in the federal parliament. There was a, there was um, a moment where this the, the concept of healing for First Nations people came to the forefront of like our community, and it was the realization that we are up against really tough lineage and trauma and intergenerational trauma when it comes to yeah. um, our DNA as First Nations people and coping yep. with colonization. Yeah. And so I feel like as First Nations people, we aren't just up against the everyday life and struggles that every human being faces, but we are also up against really strong holds throughout the generations Mm. um, that have affected our genes. And, you know, whether that is through, um, you know, health, um, drug addiction, alcoholism, poverty, there are so many indicators there that have um, created suffering within our community that, like, is just another layer for us. Right, yeah. But I think, like, also... Um, the the statistics when you were talking about mm-hmm. that before, like it is a statistic in most research that has involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander that we are most likely to experience psychological distress. Yeah, like we are more likely. I don't know what the percentage is, but it it, d- it declares that in yeah. every research. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. In any health research and and it concerns. But the thing is, people are like what is intergenerational trauma? Like they don't mm-hmm. know what it is. Yeah. And the thing is, we spoke about this maybe before a a while ago. Did I tell you about the mouse theory? No, tell us. The mouse and the cherry um, pie? No? Mm -mm. Okay. So the thing is, people think, oh, well, it happened so long ago. Like, why are you distressed now? Like, why are you psychologically distressed now? It's like, well, trauma holds in the body. And that's the Mm -hmm. reason why we do have to heal because it's there. It's in our genes. Like it's not just something that we just like wake up and we're like, oh, I just feel like being psychologically distressed today. Yeah. (laughs) It's the thing is like. It's what what, enables us to make decisions too. Exactly. And the thing is, so there was this research. They tested it on mice, um, which is very unfair, but they basically had a grandmother mice and they would make this mouse eat a cherry pie. And every time the mouse would eat the cherry pie, they'd zap it. So they'd be traumatizing it, right? And that mm-hmm. kind of executes what could that's that's trauma. Yeah. This then this um mouse then reproduces and has a mother. Um and that mother has and then that mother has a granddaughter. Mm-hmm. Both the mother and granddaughter, every time they smelt the cherry pie, mm-hmm. would have an erratic response. Wow, because it's in their genes. Because it's DNA. in their genes. Yeah. So they that, didn't know what was happening to the, the grandmother mouse, that but fear, pretty much it was yeah, passed down and down. that is instilled. And that's what I mean. Like the smell or the fear of that, it's like mm-hmm. pa- it's passed down and that's called mm-hmm. intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Like I have some trauma that I hold that I have no idea sometimes where it kind and of it comes, comes from. from. Yeah. I agree. And I'm like, oh, I no, too. I didn't have that experience. But I'm like, like I have a one thing, I have a fear of a car accident slash crash. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know where that comes from. I was, well, maybe, yeah, I had a moped accident. Yeah. But you know, like I look at that experience and I'm like, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah. Just went. Anyways, but I, yeah, but you're right about the um, the Healing Foundation, I guess, stolen generation mm-hmm. was trauma. Yeah. And then they started instilling, you know, the Healing Foundation to to try and repair this and try to work on this. And so, so much research and so much study has been done, but there's so yeah. much work to be done personally as well, like not yeah. just in communities I think, you know, people should look, regardless if you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, you mm. should always be, like, focusing on your healing. Or- yeah. Well, I just hope for our community, and this is, like, a deep hope of mine that I have. Yeah. It's, like, I hope that our community one day can be filled with light and not be heavy. Mm. You know, for me, an indicator of when I'm on track and when I'm not on track is I'm heavy, like, mentally drained all the time, heavy, 
find it hard to get out of bed and find it hard to take on the day. That's for me is like n- knowing that, you know, the, the, that I'm, I'm going through it at the moment. And when I feel light, I feel like I could take on the world and I feel inspired and motivated. And mm. I'm like, I want our community to be able to feel that lightness. And I know that that doesn't happen often in small towns. It doesn't happen in remote communities or rural communities. There is a heaviness. I feel it when I go home. It is trauma and it's affecting our people to the point where our people don't get to live long lives or productive lives or, you know, live out their dreams. And for me, that's my big hope is that we can feel that lightness because that is fucking inspiration and it makes you feel like you can take on the world but um 100 percent. but that's also lead by example and lead mm-hmm. by inspiration as well like yeah our younger generations aren't coming through like i just feel so excited because we do have like more, such a deadly yeah, young generation coming through i must admit yeah the kids are i work with they're just you know like one of the girls you know that d- did an assignment on me and they were like talking about growth perspective and i mm-hmm. just thought and I chose to do grief, which is <laughs> I probably should have taken. I should have done, you know, done like challenges in overcoming football injuries or something like, you know, well, real standard. Look, take, take this not like not as a stab at all, but you're probably an expert in grief. You've been through a fucking <laughs> lot, so don't worry. You I got know. your PhD in grief without the certificate. Well, generally, how I talk when I open a keynote as well is like, look, I'm not an expert on anything, but I'm an mm. expert on my life. <laughs> So, yes. Like I've analyzed my yes. life and my experiences yeah, and down to a the lot of grief. Yeah, but and it was actually really kind of perfect in a way because my poor student um lost her brother and mm-hmm. it really has had an impact on her. And I didn't actually I completely forgot I, I genuinely just went to what has been the biggest challenge in my life and it was losing two of the most influential women of my mm-hmm. life, you know, especially at the same age as her. So I went back to being her age and what was that impact. Mm. So it, was, it wasn't it was intentional but we're talking about growth perspective and healing and the stuff that she reiterated back to me about her experiences and her journey with grief and homesickness and missing her brother, mm. I was like, this is the generation that are becoming so comfortable with their selves, acknowledging their experiences, growing from their experiences, and then being like, what can I do for my life and in the future? Like they're so determined and it makes me so excited about where we are at and getting to that point where we are light in a way. I, yeah. I, I love that. I feel like yeah. that is um, a beautiful projection for our future, our young people being able to share their experiences. Right? But if, you know, our young people are listening to this or anyone, especially if you're First Nation, there is a helpline. Uh, which yeah, is this- one three yarn where you can ring up and it's yep. a mob to mob conversation and you're able to you know share your experiences but also you know get um, therapy if you need and, and and open that conversation so you do feel light. But I actually called one three yarn two weeks ago. Oh, was it good? There were moments where I was like, oh my god, I don't need this. Like I could have access to a therapist. You know, like mm-hmm. I thought, oh no, I'm just using a platform or a service that you know. You know, I'm within means, you know, I have yeah. stuff. But I was like, it actually really did help me, yeah. if I'm being honest. Like, mm-hmm. I just I just generally wanted to talk to someone who was non-biased yep. and not in my life and didn't know who I was. And, yeah, and it was actually really, <laughs> really nice. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's yeah. what it's all about, sharing and exactly. being able to have a conversation with someone who can help you, um, you know, when you need it. And even if it is a yarn, they're, they're, you're not looking for solutions. You're just there to have a yarn. So one, three yarn, that is, if you need yeah. to have that yarn. But thank you so much for listening to us today. You've been listening to First Things First. If you love what you hear, leave us a little rating or a little review. And if you want us to cover anything on the pod, reach out via our socials. My handle's at brooke.blerton. Maddie's handle is at it's Maddie Mills. And we'll see you next week. Stay Bye. deadly, mob. <laughs>